my ex-partner. So you've killed your ex-partner? I'm pretty sure she's dead now. Yeah. She's not moving at all. So I'm pretty sure she's dead. There are people around us whose lives are not what they seem. They walk among us, but carry an invisible burden. They are victim survivors of domestic abuse, well over three million adults and children in this country. I've been writing about the crisis of domestic abuse in Australia for the past six years now, and there's no question that it's a crisis. A mother of three was killed in an axe attack just a week after... Jane Robertson decided Katie Haley wasn't allowed to leave him, so he bashed her to death with an iron bar. Believed Hannah Clark's estranged husband doused her and their young children in petrol and then set fire to the car they were in. Every week, a woman is killed by a former or current partner. That's a statistic we can't accept. Every red flag was flying, but we didn't intercede. It's one of the most important stories going on in this country right now, and one of the most urgent problems for us to solve. And it is solvable. I'm going to explore some of the innovations that are changing the way we respond to this crisis. Systems which make the perpetrator accountable. I just felt like I was the victim and that everyone else was to blame. As well as the controversial solutions being introduced worldwide. Well, no doubt they're surprised when they go and get him. They always assume it's something that they've maybe done last week or last month. Yeah. They don't realise it's going back years. Domestic violence is one of the worst things to get involved in because it's so hard to recover from. has changed since I started writing about domestic abuse. The Me Too movement saw millions of women share horrifying stories of sexual harassment, rape and assault. Powerful men have been outed. We're talking about these issues in ways that were unthinkable even a decade ago. But the Me Too movement hasn't really taken us inside people's homes. We need to believe a truth that has been evident since the 1970s, that aside from the police and the military, the family is actually the most violent social group in our society. We're only just starting to grapple with the gigantic task at hand in this country. But almost 2.2 million women have experienced physical sexual abuse from an intimate partner, which means that hundreds of thousands of men have perpetrated it. We need to stop being surprised when we hear about another nice guy who's been caught abusing his wife and kids. We need to make his abuse visible so we can stop him before he ends up killing them. For decades, Phil Cleary has been saying this as he watches history repeat itself. Mum gives birth to four boys and then suddenly a girl arrives. Vicky Marie Cleary, born in 1961. There was nine years between Vicky and me. And I didn't really see the boyfriends until the man who killed her arrived on the scene. Peter Raymond Keogh. He was aggressive and nasty and I did not like him. When Vicky declared that the relationship was over, I was ecstatic. I discovered later on when I researched his life that he said things like, no Sheila leaves me, they leave when I say so. I 
I've been here hundreds of times. I've imagined standing here as Vicky pulled her car up and seeing Keo across the road. I've imagined it. Mad, isn't it? But that's, that's what it does to you. Vicky drove to work on the 26th of August, 1987, at 8 a.m. She drove south down Cameron Street, and as she reached the kindergarten, she swung her car to the right sharply. I suspect she saw Keo to her left. Vicky parked right here. Keo scrambled across the street grabbed the front door, swung it open, and grabbed her car keys. A couple of blokes who worked nearby had parked on the other side of the road. They heard the screams. They saw him drag her out of the car, wrap his arm around her, and deliver at least four knife wounds to her stomach, which pierced her liver. The people witnessing it didn't rush over and stop him. They were traumatised, I suppose, paralysed by the moment. After Keo drove that knife into Vicky's liver, he dropped her on the ground, he walked across this road and he wiped the knife as he did it. And then he kind of ambled down the street and went and had a cup of coffee in an auction room round the corner and gave himself up, you know, three hours later. When she was taken to the hospital, the first thing she said to the doctor was, please don't let me die. I was with mum and the family in the hospital when the surgeon arrived at the door and he said, I'm really sorry, Mrs. Cleary, but we couldn't stop the bleeding. Your daughter is dead. She left a man, she paid for it with her life. Vicky was 25 years of age. We went to court in February 1989. In the courtroom, Keo, the killer, argued for a defence of provocation. It was argued that Vicky Cleary, by her actions in leaving Keo, provoked him to kill her. It seemed Vicky Cleary was to blame for her own murder. The jury reduced his conviction to manslaughter. I was outraged by the courtroom narrative and your sister allegedly told a man to F off or piss off, and that that caused him to lose self-control. We were treating it as if it was a normal practice. Peter Keogh was out of jail three years and 11 months after he murdered Vicky in Cameron Street. Vicky's case told the world that that law had to be abandoned and that we had to revisit the question of the rights of women. I was in the federal parliament for four years. I won Bob Hawke's seat in Wills. I put a question in 94 about the provocation defence. It took another 10 years before the provocation defence was abolished. We're having a much uh, more sophisticated discussion about violence against women. We know that it is men who are the problem. We have to put into place risk management that actually defines the Keos of the world as domestic terrorists, and that means strategies that will stop them in their tracks. Today in New South Wales, repeat offenders of domestic violence are tracked alongside terrorist suspects. So Jess, this is the monitoring room. Uh, from here we do all electronically monitored offenders across New South Wales. Currently there's about 950 of those. And how many of those are DV offenders? Currently I think the number is about 42. What do you have to do to be one of those 42? How bad does it have to get? 
it's essentially someone who's assessed at some high risk of DV reoffending and who have a current apprehended domestic violence order and that has to specify a geographical exclusion. Every offender in this electronic monitoring program is fitted with a smart tag like this one. And that's it. Wow, so you don't forget about that in a hurry, do you? No. What would that look like if I'm walking around? Where do you actually see me? If you uh, want to look up here on the screen, yeah. this is essentially a map of points that have been collected by one of our devices. Those points on the map track that person's movement 24-7. And this is the exclusion zone up here? That's correct. We'll have certain locations, be it a person's home, a person's place of work, a school for example. And then if the person that we're actually monitoring goes near one of those zones, yes. and we get alerts off the system, then we escalate the process from there. They are a very different cohort to a lot of other offenders, aren't they? Yeah, there tends to be a level of recalcitrance and impulsivity around their actions. We can't just monitor or jail the enormous number of men who abuse, and nor should we. But there are relatively few programs that can help these men change their dangerous behaviours. Here in Western Australia, abusive men are offered a rare opportunity. Over three months, they can access full-time assistance to at least start the enormous task of turning their lives around. All righty, guys, I'm ready to check in. Who wants to start? It's the first residential men's behaviour change program in the Southern Hemisphere. Just the effort from coming from jail into here, hoping to learn and get it, get it all sorted on the way, you know? I was fucked all the time, you know? I don't know how else to describe it. Um, I, I, I started being controlling, um, paranoid, really untrusting, um, economic abuse, or, uh, everything like that, you know? Um, coercion and threats. I've assaulted her. I was a monster. I was a complete monster. Uh, oh, yeah, it ended up with me degrading her. <laughs> belittling her, controlling her. I dominated her, I've punched doors and I strangled her. It was a space span of maybe 25 seconds, which is the worst 25 seconds of my life. But that's what happened. I'd, I've lost everything and everyone, but I'm getting back with, with their help. The majority of our guys suffer from high anxiety. We have guys with quite a lot of depression and low self-esteem uh, self and self-efficacy. So we need to separate the person from the behaviour and say, hey, as a person, you know, you're, you're a good guy. And what can we do with them to look at that behaviour over there and change that behaviour? My father, he was a, uh, he's a convicted pedophile. Nothing happened to me or my, my brother, but things happened to extended family members. I idolised my, my dad, you know, and then finding out that he's such a monster, you know, I, I, it just shattered me, really. So what are we putting on that? Just salt and pepper? We need to spend the first three or four weeks developing a relationship with the guys, and then we actually get ourselves into a position where we earn the right to actually speak into their lives. This afternoon, you're going to write a letter from your partner's perspective. This really seems to have the biggest impact. It's, we get them to write a letter from their partner's perspective to them, telling them about their experience um, of the violence and what have been the ongoing um, impacts and, and consequences for them. You can see as you're explaining to the guys what we want them to do, you can actually see them sort of shrinking back in their chairs and, and some of them go really, really pale as they, they realise that they're going to have to revisit that and, and show some real accountability. The hardest thing is being honest with yourself. You can lie to everybody, but you can't lie to yourself. Residents of this men's behaviour change program are challenged to reflect on the impacts of their abuse. 
put yourself in your partner's shoes. Your partner's going to write the letter back to you about the impact that your violence has had on her and her life. Who would like to volunteer? Tissues and that's all right. Yep. Ah, you're right. It's a safe space, no one judges you. Nothing that is said is wrong. The boys wake up screaming several times a night from nightmares <coughs> since you've left. And they run around all day looking for you, calling out your name, asking where you are. It breaks my heart. I see, see you when I look at the kids. It hurts me to think how and they're so afraid of you and the fact that you're not here for them. Amen. Women and children shouldn't have to leave their home because they're a victim of domestic violence. If they love their partner and they want to keep their family together, then we want to make sure that when their partners come home that they are more aware of their emotions to be able to reintegrate back into that, that family environment. I was embarrassed to go to the school to pick up my kids because of bruises, black eyes, I was just your boxing bag. As you're well aware, the result of your abuse led to our son being taken into DCP care, and I will never forgive you for that. I still am scarred by your abuse. How was it for, for you to write that? Oh, just painful. Mm. Yeah, it's not nice. No. Part of the program is to acknowledge that shame and guilt. That's a very heavy emotion and it's a very powerful emotion. So hold on to that emotion because next time you feel your anger rising, think of that shame or guilt and replace that with how proud you felt within some aspect of the program. Before I came to Breathing Space, every time that I got into trouble, I always thought that I was the one being hard done by. I just felt like I was the victim and that everyone else was to blame. Dear Travis, the way you have treated me has left me with issues that may never go away. I'm now going to be frightened if I ever see you get angry or look like you're not handling life very well. I was completely shattered when you made the choice to hurt me and I always have the anxiety I might get hurt if you aren't coping emotionally. It's your fault you have done this to us. Writing the letters from the partner's perspective and uh, yeah, it's just, it just crushes me, you know. I feel a great sense of shame really, like shame and absolutely disgusted with myself, so yeah. And remember being in this room at this time saying nobody deserves this because you're dead right and nobody does, yeah? Um, domestic violence is one of the worst things to get involved in because it's so hard to recover from. You know, it's life ruining. Tonight, solving the domestic abuse crisis. In a special forum, Jess Hill and a panel of experts will discuss the solutions we need right after the final episode of See What You Made Me Do. Tonight, 9.30 on SBS and On Demand. If you think that technology is being used against you or someone you know, here are some simple steps you can take. Use password protection to secure your devices and use two-factor authentication where possible. Stay safe on social media. Finally, when safe to do so, disable your location settings. Also keep an eye out for other tracking and surveillance devices. You know your situation best, so do what feels safest for you. For more support, visit esafety.gov.au forward slash women. Living better can mean yeah! living like this. With Medibank Live Better, you can be inspired, find free activities and get rewarded along the way. Anaconda's Ultimate Snow Gear Sale is on now. Adult snow jackets and pants by 37 degrees south, just $49. Kids snow jackets and pants by 37 degrees south, only $39. Head in store or shop online at anacondastores.com. Anaconda! Introducing Every Plate. 
delivering all the ingredients you need and nothing you don't for tasty, fuss-free meals. You can cook in four easy steps. Yum! All from only $2.99 per plate. Now that's thrifty. It's like music to your ears and your wallet. Every plate, it's what every plate's been waiting for. Sign up today at everyplate.com.au. When it comes to dealing with domestic abuse and family violence, frontline police officers too often fall short. Victim survivors who go to police face a front desk lottery. They may get a cop who goes above and beyond to protect them. Or they may get one who dismisses or even ridicules them. Policing domestic abuse is complex, specialist work. So why don't we create a specialist force to deal with it? In Argentina, that's exactly what they've done. Hola, soy Graciela. Estuve 29 años en pareja con el papá de mis hijos y mi agresor, mi victimario. La verdad no sé cuándo empezó la violencia. Todos los días me decía que me iba a matar él. Él me iba a reventar la cabeza contra la pared. ¿Sabes qué linda van a quedar las paredes de nuestra casa adornada con tus sesos? Era violencia verbal permanente, pero... me ha violado un montón de veces. Te mato y en este país no va nadie en cana. Yo no voy en cana. Menos por matar una lacra como vos. Cuando mi hija tenía tres años, me fui a vivir a otra ciudad. Yo hice una denuncia por violencia, todo. Estuve encerrada con un hombre, policía, como una hora. Yo me sentía completamente incómoda, mal. Sentía que ese hombre me iba a hacer lo mismo que me había hecho el padre de mi hija. Tuve que denunciar ante un juez, ¿no? pero el mismo juez le dijo a él dónde yo estaba con mi hija y él me fue a buscar. When Argentina emerged from a military dictatorship in the 1980s, there was no way women were going to report their abusers to police. For years, police had perpetrated state-sanctioned torture, rape, abduction and murder. The Handmaid's Tale was based in part on life in Argentina under the generals. In the 1980s, the fledgling democracy looked to Brazil for a new feminist model for policing violence against women. Women's police stations run for women and primarily by women. For Graciela, women's policing offered an opportunity to finally escape her abusive partner. Y ahora después, 20 y pico años después, cuando caí en la comisaría de la mujer, y me atendieron mujeres. Y, y me atendieron mujeres. Eso fue, lo, no sé, yo me sentí contenida. Es mucho más que contenida. Me sentí entendida. Y cuando la chica me dice, ¿qué has detenido? Que quédese tranquila, ¿qué has detenido? Para mí fue... Fue la de mi libertad. women's police stations across Buenos Aires. In an average year, they handle over 250,000 reports of abuse. Venimos de una familia patriarcal, del hombre es el que tiene el poder, eh, por vergüenza. Eso impedía que se acercaran a, a denunciar esas situaciones de violencia que ocurrían dentro de la casa. Hoy en día, con la visibilización que estamos haciendo sobre la violencia, se están acercando y se animan a denunciar. Que no voy a decir que solo las mujeres estamos preparadas para asistir a las víctimas de violencia de género familiar, porque hemos sufrido, digamos, hemos atravesado por esas desigualdades. Entonces podemos entender la situación un poco mejor. 
a woman reports abuse at one of these police stations, she'll be offered access to social workers, psychologists and lawyers. The stations also provide mothers and kids with emergency clothing, food and accommodation. Police will even care for the kids while their mother is being interviewed. Esta mujer me va a encontrar que estoy loca porque yo sentía que estaba loca. Y no, nada que ver. De todo el ciclo de la violencia que ella me estaba contando, me estaba diciendo que hacían, era lo que me había pasado a mí. Y bueno, ¿y vos cómo estás? ¿Grá? ¿Bien? Ahora vamos a esperar que se vayan conectando las chicas. Siempre sos la primera, siempre ella puntual. Siempre. <risa> Hacemos grupos de autoayuda. Somos más de 120 mujeres y la que nos ayuda a salir adelante y a empoderarnos. Es así, ahora estás así, pero no vas a estar siempre así. La felicidad, eh, la libertad, eso es único. Precio, ponerte lo que quieras, comer lo que quieras. ¿Cómo si quieras. es? Vos podés, lo ves como si fuera imposible, como que nada de esto existe, pero todo pasa. Y a ver, que nos pase lo que pase, siempre vamos a tener, no solo en el grupo. Y, pero gracias a Dios y a la ayuda, como digo, este programa de las comisarías de la mujer, que logré salir y hoy después de un año y medio estoy mucho mejor. Dentro de un año entrevista en medio voy a estar mucho mejor. Sí. En Buenos Aires, one in five police stations are women's police, and they're given a clear mission to prevent gendered violence. That's why the officers who work here, which does include a small number of men, don't just wait for victim survivors to arrive on their doorstep. They use their profile to campaign for gender equity across the community even within the broader police force. Nosotros desde la superintendencia estamos realizando talleres eh, sobre más, nuevas masculinidades. Sabemos que de la noche a la mañana eh, no vamos a, a transformar a una persona con conductas violentas. No es una enfermedad, es una conducta aprendida. Eso nos va a llevar tiempo, pero bueno, vamos eh, avanzando y vamos en camino a eso. The women's policing model has taken off across the world, from Bolivia to the Philippines. The stations create cost-effective frontline defense and promise an end to the front desk lottery. Specialist police stations run by officers with a complex understanding of domestic abuse make sense in Australia too. But to get true systemic change, we need to go deeper. We have a fundamental problem with domestic abuse in this country. Our justice system, our family law system, sees it predominantly as a collection of physical incidents, an assault, a rape. But what it can't see is when domestic abuse becomes a system of entrapment. That entrapment may be anything between brutally violent or not physically violent at all. It is a matter of urgency that our systems recognise this most dangerous and least understood form of domestic abuse, coercive control. I'm Rowan. And I'm Hannah. And whether you're just getting started or whether you already have some experience, we would love to hear more about how we can help you improve your health and fitness journey. Hannah Clark and her three children, Alia, Liana and Trey, lived in fear of Rowan Baxter. Their husband and father had no history of physical violence, but his coercive control had gone on for years. Things like going through her phone, ringing her all through the day, checking where she was. If she locked up the gym, he would ring her. She should be at a certain place at a certain time on her way home, and why wasn't she? She wasn't allowed to walk off the beach in her bikinis. She wasn't allowed to wear pink because that was for children. They were fighting a lot, mm. arguing a lot. And even Aaliyah, the elders, would say, for goodness sake, Daddy, Mummy said sorry enough, you know, can't you be nice to her? 
he demanded sex every night. She hated it. And if um, she wasn't enthusiastic, he would get very annoyed and not speak to her for days. He'd sulk. That was another thing he would do. He'd sulk mm, for days. He wouldn't speak wouldn't for speak. days. Or he'd threaten to kill himself. When I said it's domestic violence, she said, he's never hit me, Mum. Mm. Well, you, you could see it was mental, though. You know, she was a broken woman mm. before she left. She was frightened. She actually said to me, who gets the children when he kills me, Mum? He killed them a week after. to criminalise coercive control are getting louder in Australia. Thanks, Nicole. Criminalising coercive control will not magically fix our deeply flawed justice system, but it will replace the broken lens we have on domestic abuse. Instead of seeing a collection of incidents, it will make visible the system of abuse that endangers and even kills so many women and children. So how do we accomplish this? Obviously, we can't just cut and paste foreign legislation, but we can look at how other countries have criminalised it. The United Kingdom was first in the world to criminalise coercive control. Housing checks have confirmed that he has a residence at in Glasgow that will be known as Location 1, which myself and Nicola are going to be attending. In Scotland, police are planning to arrest a serial abuser with a long history of coercing and controlling his partners. The conversation continues after the show. Join Jess Hill and a panel of experts as we discuss how to actually solve the domestic abuse crisis, which solutions are real, and what can you do to make a difference. That's next on SBS. When it comes to medical care, you want the best for you and your family. This is MedSons on Frontier. We strive to provide the best quality health care and vital medical assistance for people who need it most. Donate now. Stop thinking, start feeling. The BMW 218i Grand Coupe. 175 per week at 4.49% per annum. Business customers only. Search BMW 2 Series. Okay, any guesses on this week's super buys? Surveillance drones. Not quite. Check out this detailing trolley with an adjustable shelf for $99. Or this backseat organiser, only $9.99. Super buys while stocks last. I love cat price servicing. Every service, one low price. And it came with a Toyota. Get the Toyota Value Advantage and pay one low price every service with cat price servicing. Oh, what a feeling. Toyota. When you're ready to buy a home, it's nice to know that people have your back. At People's Choice, we're for getting that first home and for buying your next. We're for growing families and separate bedrooms. We're for reaching new heights and the great rates that make it all possible. We're for being able to pay it off and for taking the night off. Because when you're home and happy, we're happy too. Ready to make it happen? Jump online today. People's Choice. Respect is the key element needed in all our relationships. With ourselves. With our partners. And with our children. Respect is key. Relationships Australia provides support to maintain respectful relationships. Good drama entertains you. Hello, girls. Great drama changes you. He's going down. He's going to take me with him. Demand different. We don't hide. We fight. No matter where the war finds you today, just remember, we are still here. Demand different in 2021. SBS On Demand. In Scotland, police are preparing to detain a suspect who has a pattern of coercing and controlling his partners. I'm looking to get his phone. I presume that when we tell him to get himself ready um, to come with us, he'll just grab his wallet, keys, jacket and phone. If not, uh, warrants are here. 
in the new legislation. It recognises a wide range of behaviours that are perpetrated um, in a pattern and generally in a long-term basis. So it really is around that psychological, financial uh, uh, and economic abuse. And any evidence that you can show in relation to that has been considered by the courts as part of this offence. You'll no doubt be surprised when we go and get him. They yeah. always are, aren't they? Yeah. They always assume it's something that they've maybe done last week or last month, yeah. but they don't realise it's going back years. Yeah. And one of the things that domestic abuse perpetrators tend to do is force their victims to keep that record of their behaviour. When you speak to victims, they may not see it as evidentially important, but when you've got um, officers and staff who understand the importance of these nuances to uh, perpetrators' abusive behaviours, then it becomes um, really quite straightforward. I've always said the relationship started the same way. It was loving, it was caring. He would take them out, he would do nice things for them and then it just slowly but surely changed. Um, it seemed to be the beginning, it was more the mental and emotional abuse that started with before going on to the physical mm -hmm. and it's the same with all of them, it was the same routine, you know, making them lose their confidence completely to the point where they feel no one's going to believe them. This police task force hasn't had to learn the complexities of coercive control on the job they've been receiving specialist face-to-face -face training. There's a current partner that lives with him who is not aware of the investigation and we've not spoken to this yet. You never know what you're going to walk into. People are unpredictable. We know what we know about them, but sometimes that can like, you know, change um, very quickly. spending today talking about coercive control and for a lot of the victims that we support their first experience of domestic abuse was controlling behaviour. The men and women in this room are amongst thousands of frontline police across the UK who are being taught to reframe their thinking on domestic abuse. The challenge with coercive control is we're starting to talk about people's feelings and how somebody made them feel and we don't really have the emotional literacy to be able to do that very well. A colleague of mine, he couldn't get any information out of this female victim when he was trying to get a statement. So he was looking around trying to think of things that we could just strike up a conversation to sort of make it a little bit more humane. And he said to her, oh, you've got dogs, what kind of dogs have you got? And she said, I haven't got any dogs. He forces me to eat my food out of that dog bowl. Think about some of these questions, things like, do you feel like you're walking on eggshells? Are you feeling anxious? Getting that insight that our risk assessment questions don't necessarily elicit. We have to start to think outside of the box. Is she isolated, do we think? It's longitudinal change that we're looking at, so police officers will continue to question their practice and that embedded change will go on for years. Was that a safe space for her to make a disclosure? Why not? because he was there. Officers will say to us, oh, I remember that piece of information, I remember that question. So there will always be a seed that's planted for officers and if that helps protect one victim, then it's working. In Glasgow, police are arresting the alleged perpetrator. He is taken into custody and will eventually be tried in court. And it is his controlling behaviours that will lead to a conviction. The most satisfying part for me is in contacting the women that I've been dealing with throughout the entire investigation and informing them of the outcome of the inquiry. A lot of them don't think they're going to be believed um, because it's been ingrained into them for that length of time that they won't be. So just to be able to give them feedback that, you know, it came to a positive outcome. The outcomes in Scotland's first year of criminalising coercive control have been impressive. 
So we had nearly 1,700 reports of the new offence in the first year, but court proceedings were commenced in 96% of the cases that we reported, which is the absolute key figure. So really, really high, high detection rates for us, high success in prosecuting cases. You know, the benefits of it far outweighs any of the challenges that you face in implementing the legislation. It absolutely recognises that domestic abuse is one of the most serious offences in Scotland. The Scottish Government didn't just consult the women's sector on these laws, they had them co-write the legislation. Criminalising coercive control has not just changed the way domestic abuse is policed, it is changing culture and educating the community on exactly how coercive control looks and feels. The need to understand and detect coercive control is urgent, not just because of the immeasurable impact it's having on hundreds of thousands of Australians, but because controlling behaviour is typical in men who murder their wives and kids. She could never tell him she was going to leave. It was too dangerous. She knew it was too dangerous. He would never let her go. So eventually, she was at the gym with her two best friends and Nikki said to her, this is it, we're gonna do it. He's at work today, we know he's at work. We'll go home, get Leah from school. And she did it. They just had two garbage bags of things, belongings for her and the three children. We got the house ready. We got bunk beds in for the kids and started getting things sorted and ready for them to come. She felt so good once she got here. She said it felt like a whole weight's been lifted off her. He had visitation with them after she left and everyone was happy for that. I didn't like him, but I was more than happy to help him out with the kids. It wasn't until he kidnapped Liana mm. that he wasn't allowed the children then until there was mediation and we had something in place that guaranteed we'd get the children back. Adelia was petrified. When he took Liana, she was running down the street screaming at him to let Liana go. And she was so angry when she got home. I think she felt she didn't do enough to save mm. her sister. Once he started losing control, he spiralled. And he started spiralling bad. The conversation continues after the show. Join Jess Hill and a panel of experts as we discuss how to actually solve the domestic abuse crisis, which solutions are real, and what can you do to make a difference. That's next on SBS. Hello again from the SBS newsroom. Tonight, India's deadliest day of the pandemic. A third Australian man is among the growing number of COVID-19 casualties. A ceasefire remains elusive in the Middle East tonight as fighting spills into a tenth day. And a giant leap for Australia's Defence Force as it launches its space division. I'll have a full SBS World News Bulletin at 10.20. At ENS, we know that nothing feels better than getting that new appliance feeling. And right now, you can get this Westinghouse dishwasher only $5.99 or this huge Westinghouse fridge just $11.99 and save $300 on this 8 kilo ASCO washer, now only $13.99. Plus, get free delivery on fridges, dishwashers, washers and dryers. We'll also install your dishwasher from only $99. And we won't be beaten on price. So visit one of our nine showrooms today or shop online and get the ENS feeling for less. Discover the finest flavors and rich aromas locked in each Lore capsule for your Nespresso machine. Lore Espresso, a masterpiece in taste. Climb a tower and be a princess and get shot at with arrows, wizards throwing spell packets. It's an amazing feeling. It's euphoric. There are so many ways we can live better. Search Medibank Live Better to find yours. 
I'll, I'll be back in the tea. So, how many weeks are you? 13. But shh, you know I haven't told Dad yet. <laughs> Dad, how did you know? Have you heard of Amplifon? Amplifon has been providing the latest technology in hearing aids for over 70 years. With over 300 Amplifon clinics, our audiologists will assess your hearing using our exclusive approach. Call 13 My Ears to book a free hearing test. That's 13 69 32 77. Amplifon, the hearing care professionals. When you shopped at IGA over the last year, it mattered far more than you realise. It meant we were able to support local restaurants by selling their meals. It helped us employ more locals. Great job. And we could keep supporting our local charities. Because when you shop at any IGA around Australia, you're not just supporting them, but the local community as well. And for that, each and every IGA says thank you. When relationships turn abusive, technology is often turned against women. If you think abuse through technology is happening to you or someone you know, eSafety provides help and advice in 12 languages at esafety.gov.au forward slash women. Eight renowned Aussies find their place in history. Like an Agatha Christie novel. Starting with Celia Pacola. The boy who drowned in front of his brother. A brand new season of Who Do You Think You Are starts Tuesday 8th of June on SBS and On Demand. Okay. Come here. Wait. We were concerned the whole time that he would turn up. I put locks on the gates down the side and under the house just so he couldn't get in. I'd left for work in the morning at about 7.30, kissed them all goodbye, said I loved them. Hannah had them ready for school and he must have been, we presume, hiding at the side of the house. She went out to get the kids into the car, got the kids in their seat belts, and as she got in the car, we think he ambushed her and jumped in the passenger side. And he had a knife and he had a can of petrol. And he threw petrol over them all and told Hannah to drive. So she drove down the street and turned the corner where she spotted a fellow on the other side of the street washing his car. She just drove the car straight at him, screaming out. She had a window down saying, call the police, call the police, he's throwing petrol over us. And when he looked up, uh, Rowan had Hannah in a bear hug and wouldn't let her go and she was fighting to get out. There was an almighty flash and Hannah got out and she was on fire. So he told her, to hit the ground and roll, and he hosed her. And this fellow never realised the children were in the car. A father and his three children have died in a car fire in Brisbane. The children's mother managed to escape the burning vehicle and is tonight in hospital with extensive injuries. When the police got there, she gave them a statement while she was on the ambulance stretcher and told the police what had happened. It's the only reason we know. And then she came to again in the hospital and retold the same story. Despite suffering severe burns to 97% of her body, Hannah was able to give first responders a detailed account of how her estranged husband set fire to her car with her children inside. Hannah Clark died last night in hospital from horrific burns. Police have now revealed they knew she was a victim of domestic violence. Once again, people are crying out for better protection for women and children. What do we do to ensure that we don't have another homicide next week? Women and children violently die every week in our country. Somehow the system just doesn't work. Our thoughts go out to those who are close to the family. It is just too horrible to contemplate. How does such evil happen in our land? Do we seriously believe that we didn't know that Hannah Clark's murderer was not a possible killer of her? 
Every red flag was flying, every red flag, but we didn't intercede. 60 women a year are dying at the hands of misogynist men. I want to say to Hannah Clark's family, don't think you got it wrong. You did not. You got it right. You told people, your daughter told people, she told the police, the courts knew. The failure was in the state. So what's missing? We've got to have politicians who don't just uh, talk the platitudes in the parliament about, oh, we're, we're opposed to violence against women, we'll go to a funeral. No, we've got to have them all say, we're committed to taking that 60 to zero and we will find the resources to do that. So ask the politicians, the state, the police force, are they serious about stopping men like Keogh and men like Baxter and all the men in between? I come here and I think of my sister Vicky. And you know, I want to continue to be inspired by her and the other women who we've lost, but who should inspire us to save women in the future. Every time I come here, I say to her, I love you and I loved you and I'll continue to love you. to grieve, but there is also so much to hope for. We've only just scratched the surface of what can be done to stop domestic abuse. There are courageous people in Australia and beyond who are getting together inside their communities and who are tackling this crisis in all new ways and getting remarkable results, including actual reductions in domestic homicide. This can be done. We can do this and we have to do it. We have to do it for our children today and for our generations yet to come, for our girls and for our boys. And for those who don't believe it's possible, I want to leave you with one final thought. All revolutions seem impossible until they are inevitable. That was the final episode of See What You Made Me Do. Up next, join Jess Hill and a panel of experts as they discuss what it would take to actually solve the domestic abuse crisis in Australia. If you or someone you know is experiencing family violence, call 1800 RESPECT on 1800 737 732 or visit 1800respect.org.au. For counselling for men who have anger, relationship or parenting issues, call the Men's Referral Service on 1300 766 491 or visit ntv.org.au. In an emergency, call 000. Tonight, how...